OK, um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, I know it's Friday, so I appreciate you're here. Um, my name is Wojtek Tyczyński. Um, I work in Google. I'm the TL of six scalability. And together with Marcel Ziemba, um, who is one of the chairs of six scalability, we are going to, to present like the six scalability update today. Um, OK, so let's start. So. Uh, what we are actually doing, what the six scalability is actually doing. So there are basically five main aspects of things we are doing, which kind of correspond to sub projects. But uh, um, in terms of like six scalability, that doesn't really own any non test related code. Like sub projects, is, um, sub -projects are somewhat, um, somewhat fluid here. So, um, so yeah, so. The first thing that we are doing is actually defining what does scalability really mean for Kubernetes. Um, it, it both means like defining, defining um, what does it actually mean, but also like where we are actually heading. Like the core principle for any scalability related efforts is to um, focus on actual real life scenarios and real life needs like optimization for the sake of optimization doesn't really make sense because it usually with some exceptions but usually it's like complicates the system so we should be only focusing on things that are um, really needed for someone um, the next thing that is like strictly related to that is like once we have those goals like we need to actually execute towards those so um, so actually driving and Ex ensuring that like the actual improvements that are needed to to, to get to those goals are are um, are something that we are working on. Um, this doesn't really mean in many cases that we are doing the improvements. Um, if if those are fitting into um, individual SIGs like I don't know SIG nodes or SIG API and machinery or whatever, we are trying to um, to work with those SIGs and ensure that those will be doing that. But we are often um, also contributing to those themselves. And for any cross-sig um, improvements, then there were a bunch of those like over the past years. Um, we, are, we are usually coordinating those across those SIGs too. Um, the next thing is um, ensuring or checking where we actually are. Like we know where we would like to be based on the first item, but um, we don't really often know where exactly we are now. Um, so, monitoring and measuring where exactly we are is, is, is pretty critical to, 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 to understand how far we are from our goals and is there anything, is there really any work that we, we have to do in this area. Um, the next item which is strictly related to that is, um, uh, is ensuring that we are not regressing. So once we reach certain level of scalability, um, we need to ensure that uh, that we actually stay at that level. It's it's pretty pretty easy with scalability to regress um, because like every every new feature is or every new change in the system is often um, if not well thought through, it's it's often possible to easily regress the system. Um, and finally, we need to ensure that scalability is is not the job for like a very small group of of people like sitting in the corner, but it's actually a job for everyone. Like similarly to reliability or security or whatever, like when you are designing your designing and implementing your, your feature, you need to be thinking about like scalability on your own. Like we can't, like it can't be, we can't ensure scalability um, if the overall community won't be thinking about that. So we actually made a very, very long journey and very successful journey, I would say, since the, since, um, the early beginning of Kubernetes when there were pretty much like two or three of us like thinking about scalability. Now, um, scalability is actually an inherent part for pretty much every single cap, which is like, I, I, I hope that you all know what cap is. It's, it's like our design doc, more or less. Um, people are thinking about scalability, but um, not everyone knows exactly how to do it. They, they know they should be thinking about it. So this, this item is actually about ensuring that when they reach out to us, like we, we have like best practices, we um, we can recommend what they should be doing in that situation, and so on and so on. Um, okay, um, uh, one more thing probably worth mentioning is that like we, you shouldn't be confusing it or 
It's often confused, like SIG out, SIG scalability is often confused or mixed with SIG auto scaling. Like auto scaling is about scaling either your size of the cluster, like add by adding nodes or removing nodes, or um, scaling your number of pods or, or pods in general, either horizontally or vertically. Um, scalability is about like the amount of stuff that you, that you can do, or amount of, of, for example, like how big your cluster is or how many, um, how big services you can handle in a single cluster and so on and so on. Um, okay, so um, what is really scalability in terms of Kubernetes? So as I mentioned, like you should all, we should always be focused on, on actual user needs. So when you ask users if they want scalability or if they, if they want this cluster to scale, the answer is obvious. Like they are, they are all saying yes, of course. But if you know, if, if you ask them, like, what does it really mean? Um, the answer is often, like, I don't know. Or it's even more, it's often also, I don't care. Because they, they don't want to, like, understand all, all the details of the system. Um, they want us to handle that. So we need to define it our, on our own. So, like, the first approximation that we did, like, in early 2015, um, is we approximated scalability with, like, size of the cluster, so number of nodes, basically. So when I first started looking into that, like in February 2015 or something like that, like the 25 node cluster was basically blowing up. Um, and over time, we are basically improving that, like um, starting from like support for 100 nodes in 1.0, um, reaching like 5,000 nodes um, in a steps, like in, in 1.6 release. And we didn't really go higher than that since then. Um, so now you, are, now you are probably thinking like if we did anything like in the last like five years. And yes, we did. Um, we did quite a lot because like um, scalability is like actually much more than, than, than like the size of the cluster or number of nodes. Um, basically, scalability is like a multi-dimensional um, multi or scalability in Kubernetes is a multi-dimensional problem where like things like number of services, number of pods, number of um, endpoints in a service, number of persistent volumes and so on, like they all, they all actually matter for scalability. Um, so we, we introduced this concept of like scalability envelope, which is basically saying that if your cluster within, a sing, uh, with, within, within inch, each of those dimensions is actually fitting into that scalability envelope, that means that like, your cluster has, w w like, scales or your cluster will be happy, basically. Um, so what does it really mean that the, like, your cluster scales or is it happy? So we are building or we are defining that like, based on like, two main concepts. Um, SLIs and SLO. So SLI is like self service level indicator, SLO is service level objective. You can conceptually think about them as like SLI being a metric and SLO being like a metric in, in, with threshold. As it's actually much more subtle, but like conceptually it's, it's, basically, um, it's basically that. So the we are saying that like the cluster is happy if all those scalability SLOs are, are basically satisfied. So more or less, like all the metrics are within the, the threshold that we, that we define. So um, we don't have much time and we don't have like um, enough time to talk like in very details about like SLIs and SLOs. So um, if you are interested, I had a talk purely in that topic, uh, purely about that topic in like Barcelona, KubeCon, like so you can probably find, find that on, in, in YouTube if you want. So just very briefly, like we have like six main SLOs that we are currently measuring, um, SLIs and SLOs. They have like sub -variants. Some of them have, have some sub -variants, but like um, um, conceptually we have six of them. Like the, the first two are with us like since the um, very beginning. Um, the, 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 the latter four um, were added over time. Um, so as you can see, like we don't have like a super large coverage um, there are different pieces of system that aren't really covered. Like, I mean, some of them are covered implicitly, like, for example, like scheduling latency. Um, it's actually part of pod startup time or pod startup latency. So um, 
there is there is more covered like um, implicitly than 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 from what looks it's from the what, from from how it looks like from the first glance, but. Um, we are still we, we still have a bunch of like holes there, so it's it's one of the things that um, we want to invest for quite some time, and we we never like have time for that. So um, if you are interested, like it's it's definitely one of the areas that we would um, we would benefit from your help. Um, so let let's take maybe one one example and look into a little bit more detail. Um, I'm not going to. To, to read it, and I, I don't even expect you to read it. Like the, the main point is that um, even though, like the, the conceptually, the SLIs should be, um, are, 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 we are trying to make them very simple and that like high level. So basically, for mutating API calls, we can say that like the, um, what, what we want to achieve is um, that like the mutate like the 99 percent of mutating api calls is finishing one in one second and this is more, more or less what is written in the slide but we need to be super precise in the slos to ensure that the way we understand it and the way we measure it is like exactly how you as a user also understand it so it's uh, like we had a bunch of cases or i've heard about other cases also from outside kubernetes where um the the fact that like the, the ones who dis defined the SLO um, understood it differently than the actual users was, was causing um, a lot of friction. So um, we need to be super precise here. Um, oops, yeah. Okay, so um, basically, once, once we have, the, like, once we defined like, all those SLOs, um, users know what to expect where what to expect from the system or how the system will be behaving if they are within the scalability envelope, but they also like, or maybe primarily in many cases, they want to know like what the scalability envelope or how, how large it is or how, how far they can go in, in the di dimension um, they are actually interested in. So um, computing it precisely, it's like super hard or maybe even impossible. So we are not trying even to do that. We are fortunately able to like approximate it pretty well um, by by um, by providing like a certain thresholds in, in many dimensions in, in all of the dimensions um, it it's if you if you take a combination of those um, it's it's not actually the whole whole envelope it's possible to go much farther in, in, in certain dimensions if you go lower in other dimensions but we want to provide something that is um, that is easily consumable for everyone, and for the most sophisticated uh, most sophisticated users, we can work for them and explain them better now, like uh, if they can actually go farther with that. Um, okay, and with that, I'm 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 passing the microphone to Marcel, uh, who will be talking about other stuff. Thank you. So basically, right now we know what scalability means. What kind of SLOs do we care about? But the question is, like, how do we measure it? How we ensure that this, as these SLOs are actually satisfied in Kubernetes? So we will go through scalability testing infrastructure, what kind of tools we use, and basically how we ensure that Kubernetes is scalable. So our main tool that we use every day is Cluster Lo Loader 2. You can think of it as bring your own bring your own YAM, basically, kind of similar to like regular deployments that you, that you do for Kubernetes. And you can think of it as you specify kind of states in which you want to have your cluster in. For example, let's say that you want to make sure that you can run 200,000 pods in your cluster. Then what you do is you specify this state as, for example, you create 1,000 deployments with 200 pods each. Uh, and then you can specify even more states, like, OK, once I have those 200,000 pods, let's say I want to delete half of them. And when you have those states, what you can do is you can specify how you transition between those states. Because obviously, if you create 1,000 deployments with 200,000 pods in total, then most likely something will break. But what you can do is, basically say, okay, I want to create one deployment per 
10 seconds, or maybe you want to specify that um, you want to create all those 1,000 deployments within 10 minutes or one hour. So you can specify all of those transitions between states, uh, and then on top of that, once you do it, what you can do is measure, measure those SLOs that we mentioned. So you specify that, for example, you care about API latency or pod startup latency, you care that the pod startup latency will be within 10 seconds, and so on. And except for that, we have a bunch of other extra features that allow us to monitor, observe, and test it, basically. You can find all of that on our uh, documentation for Cluster Loader 2, and if you ever want to scale test Kubernetes, I strongly recommend to use this tool. But of course, as you may imagine, running 5,000 cluster nodes is pretty expensive. And in open source, what we do is actually we run 5,000 nodes every day to test for scalability regressions. Uh, but this doesn't give us like really good observability because let's imagine that you know, there is one day and there are 50 PRs merged into Kubernetes and we see some regression. This would be quite hard to kind of like see which kind of PRs are actually breaking the Kubernetes. But fortunately, we have KubeMark, and KubeMark is simulation of the cluster. Instead of running 5,000 nodes, what you can do is just run like 80 nodes, and on, to on those nodes, you can schedule pods, for example, what we call whole nodes. And hollow nodes is something that simulates regular node, but it doesn't actually run the pods. So you can think of it as, okay, regular kubelet, just takes the pod and it's running the container. But whole node just reports back to API server, I'm running the container, but it's not actually running the container. So whole node consists of actually three parts. One is whole kubelet, and we also have whole kube proxy, because kube proxy is actually um, one of the parts of Kubernetes that is putting quite a lot of pressure on the API server and Kubernetes master. And except for that, we have also hollow node uh, problem detector. So with this kind of setup, what you can do is with 600, 600 CPUs, you can test or simulate 5,000 node cluster. Um, yeah, but then you might ask, okay, so how, how do you actually run those 5,000 hollow nodes? It's, it's not easy, right? So what we do is we actually we actually create second cluster. So we have one Kubernetes cluster that is responsible for, uh, for just running those hollow nodes. And then those whole nodes connect to the actual Kubernetes master that we are scale testing with cluster loader two. Yeah, except for that, what we do is, here you can see our great tool, Pervdash. As you can see, it's quite outdated, but it's like one of the most useful tools that we have uh, in six scalability. Um, here you can see example that, okay, this is 5,000 um, CI tests that we constantly run for, for Kubernetes, and we measure here pod startup uh, latency. And you can see like 99th percentile, 50th percentile, and so on, and based on that, uh, we can detect some possible regressions, because SLO says that, okay, uh, the pod startup latency 99th percentile needs to be below five seconds. But um, we are still unhappy when, you know, the 99th percentile was three seconds and then it bumped to four seconds, for example. So we, we see it in the perf dash and based on that, we can still debug it and, and see it. Um, then, of course, we have Grafana. We are collecting like bunch of metrics. I actually recommend to, to check it out. Um, those dashboards are in our, our repository and you can use it for your own cluster if you want. Uh, and there's like a bunch of like really cool graphs that allow you to, to check like API server latency, but scheduling and, and all of that, that stuff. Then we also have profiling. So when you are running cluster loader two, what happens is that uh, it's not only like gathering those uh, Prometheus metrics, but also uh, it's getting the profiling from the API server, for example. And based on this profiling, uh, what we usually do is we go through it and see what kind of 
parts of API server is actually consuming most of the CPU or memory. And based on that, we can plan and iterate on improvements to API server. So now, OK, I talked a little bit about our infrastructure, what kind of tools we use for, for scalability testing. And now we can go back to scalability tests, what kind of tests we actually do run, and what you can see in our test grid, basically. So we have periodic tests, CI tests. And we split them into two categories. One is release blocking, and one is non-release blocking. So release blocking tests are the ones that, you know, there is new release of Kubernetes, and we see that, OK, the scalability doesn't look great. Then we say, OK, we, we just need to stop the release of Kubernetes and debug it, what, what happened, basically. Uh, and we have performance tests with 100 nodes, performance tests with 5,000 nodes, and correctness tests that make sure that uh, regular features in Kubernetes work at scale as well. Except for that, we have non-release blocking, which are kind of like more informative for us. So Kubemark is one of these examples that I talked about. Uh, but except for that, we have storage, Golang, benchmarking, different type of. But one of my favorites is actually Golang. So with Golang, we actually saw like multiple times that you know, Golang changed, the compiler changed and it totally broke Kubernetes. So we have one dedicated test just for, just for testing compiler of the Golang, which is basically running fixed version of Kubernetes, um, but we are just changing the Golang compiler. And if you are a contributor, then probably you saw our pre-submit. Uh, we have uh, 100 nodes uh, pre-submit test that it's running for each PR that um, someone is trying to merge to Kubernetes master, uh, and this is like early warning that something might be broken, basically. And it protects, basically, Kubernetes from like super, super big regressions. So yeah, now let's get to protecting scalability of Kubernetes. So this is our test grid. You can check it out. It's, uh, it's in, a, like, you know, like basically the test grid that all the tests are there, and you can find like six scalability test grid. Um, and we test also release branches, old ones, and to make sure that, you know, if there are some cherry picks to 122, 123, then they are also not breaking old versions of Kubernetes. As Wojtek mentioned before, scalability is very sensitive. And what happens is that there are so many things that can break scalability of Kubernetes. Uh, to name a few, we saw, as I mentioned before, Golang, that compiler changes can break, but also co operating system con controllers and AP API machinery, meaning like API server, schedule scheduler, etcd, and kubelet, basically everywhere. So what we do is we try to triage those issues, debug them, and once we know that, okay, the fault is because of the change in scheduler or going, what we do is we reach out to those six and try to, to help them fix those issues. And sometimes we just fix them by ourselves. Um, so I will give you a few examples of like really cool regressions that we recently debugged. So one was spot startup latency. Um, the idea was that, okay, since like 120, uh, we've been heavily investing in uh, priority and fairness. And along the way, there was one regression that significantly increased the pod startup latency. So we were the ones that were debugging. And the root cause was actually quite simple. So um, we started supporting watches in priority and fairness. And the number of goroutines that one watch was requiring was actually doubled. So instead of like having one 150,000 of goroutines, we had 300,000 goroutines. And at this point, scalability just degraded for, for pod startup latency. There's also like API call latency regression, uh, which was also connected to priority and fairness. Uh, this actually was, um, um, this actually basically increased the API call latency for all the re possible resources. And so we were also debugging it and fixing. There is pretty cool uh, debugging uh, in this issue that you can, you can find on GitHub. 
So except for protecting from scalability regressions, we are also driving scalability improvements. And recently, uh, we were helping with the migration of uh, going to 1.18. Uh, then we also help with implementing efficient watch resumption or immutable secrets. Like secrets are actually one of those things in cluster that can put quite a lot of pressure on API servers. So if you are deploying um, your workloads and, um, and let's say that you are using secrets, then maybe you should consider using immutable secrets to just make your Kubernetes API reliable, more reliable. Uh, and except for that, we also work heavily on priority and fairness, which further increases the reliability of Kubernetes. So if you want to get involved, there are a bunch of links. You can attend our public meetings. They are on Thursday, 1730. Uh, and yeah, join our Slack channel if you have any questions. Uh, our mailing list, you can, you can always reach out to us. And we are happy to help. Uh, if you are developing new features, then we can help you with reviewing it. Or if you have any issues, then we can try to help you with debugging those issues. And if you want to get involved, there are some issues that are marked as help wanted and basically getting started. And so if you are interested in our tooling, then you can help us with developing tooling. If you are interested in regressions, you can help us with debugging reg regressions. So thank you, and now it's time for Q&A. So nowadays there are sometimes more CRDs and controllers in a cluster than, than workload or, or anything else. So how do you, what do you think about this and how do you consider it? Yeah, so um, I think there are diff different aspects of that. Like well-designed well controllers with CR, like based on CRDs are not really a problem. Um, I mean, CRDs are a little bit more expensive than like built-in APIs because because of not using protobufs, for example, and using JSON and so on. But like, that's not a core of the problem. Like, we, it, it's fine. Like, the biggest problems that we see are the like node but node oriented controllers. So that like the daemon sets more or less that are like watching, or even worse, listing in some cases like a bunch of state from many nodes. So so that is really what is causing the problem. So I think that our Main problem is not the fact that we have CRDs and, and controllers. It's the fact that like, um, still there are people that are designing the controllers in an like, ineff inefficient way, I would say. Um, I think we, we would like to get to like, improve like, the, the efficiency of protobufs in general. Like the, the discussions about supporting protobufs for CRDs were happening since, I don't know, four years or something. It's just like, big thing with not high enough priority at this point. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, my question is, um, so where are uh, the trade-offs or focuses in terms of improving uh, scalability? Um, or, or where are the red lines that you would not like to cross. Uh, more concretely, for example, have you considered uh, rewriting some of the components in another language or, or switching out a very important, important component or deprecating a feature that impacts scalability a lot, but <clears throat> a lot of people rely on that? Yes, yeah, so um, good question. So, um, I think the first example that, that, you, you, that you made, for example, rewriting the components, something that we really would like to avoid. I, I don't think we want to do that. I mean, especially in a different language. I think we want to, like consistency um, is it, fairly important, like for the project as a whole, like for us as a community and so on. Like we, we don't want um, to diverge too much like between components. So I, I think it's, it's, it's probably one of those lines that we don't want to cross. Um, 
redesigning individual components. I would treat it as a last resort, I, but I wouldn't exclude it. Like, for example, networking, SIG network is actually considering, or they are, they are thinking, and there, there is even cap that is like, um, not yet approved, but like active on like how to redesign kube proxy to make it a little bit more efficient. So like those kind of things is something that we um, definitely consider, but like it should go into like individual six. Like the um, the requirements should be coming from us, but like um, it shouldn't be us doing the work. It should be that sick driving the work um, to rewrite that controller and uh, and us make like like in coordination with us and like us helping with that, but like driven by them more or less, I would say. Um, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the last part of your question. I think there was something more at the end. Uh, the last part was about deprecating features. Oh yeah, um, I think the goal is to actually uncover the regressions uh, or uncover the and scalable things like as early as possible. So that, like in general, like purely from scalability, like wearing my scalability hat, like yes, I would like, there are some things that I would like to deprecate and I would like to get rid. Um, wearing more my like production readiness hat and like, uh, like all those like higher level things, um, we really don't want to do that. Like we really don't want to break users. So um, what we are trying to do is we are trying to introduce a different way of doing stuff or the more efficient way of doing stuff. Like for example, like um, Podante Affinity is one of those features, like of one of those like scheduler features that doesn't really scale well and is causing a lot of troubles for scheduler. We introduced like the feature that is called, how is it called? Pod topology spread, if I remember correctly, that is kind of doing a very similar job or like for majority of cases. Um, so we are trying to steer people towards like a more scalable regressions by not by disallowing them to run to use the, the old ones, but rather about like giving them a carrot to to use those new ones or, or new one or better one or however you call it. There there are exceptions. I think we recently deprecated like the self link field. Um, that was part of like, like every object used to have like a self-link. That was basically like a self-link, right? Um, uh, and we, we, we actually deprecated it. It's no longer set anymore. Um, but that was done based on like significant research and, and the outcome that no one is really using it for anything useful. That and can, and like all of the cases were that we are aware in many different repos can easily be replaced with already existing stuff and that, that are not based on selfing. So um, that's the only example that I remember in the last like two, three years where we did that. Um, and we generally would really like to avoid it as a project. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I have two questions. Um, firstly, I think uh, way at the start, you mentioned you have some documented design principles for other maintainers. So, uh, or maybe I misunderstood. So, if if as a uh, as a component maintainer in in Kubernetes, I I want to go and read the the you know, the cliff notes, uh, what what should I be thinking about um, when making design changes to my component. Do you, do you have a, a general principles doc? That I think will we are missing it a little bit. Like it's, there are some pieces, some small pieces here and there written, but I think um, one of the things with is we are missing like this go to page that you can go and like read those are seven things that you should first think about it. Mm -hmm. And if you are interested then like, in more detail, let's chat, but um, we are actually missing that really. Yeah, but also like if if you are uh, developing uh, some component, then I would recommend like just adding it to to our uh, load test, uh, so it will be just covered by our regular CI tests, which can also be helpful for you. 
if it's possible, of course, because it's not, not always possible. I maintain uh, cloud components, so um, yeah, normally not, but um, uh, okay. Um, so my other one was, was kind of related to the previous question. So uh, I was kind of interested if you could, you described um, diagnosing a pod latency issue and uh, the root cause was, I think you said, uh, a change had doubled the number of Go routines on watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, presumably somebody had a reason for doubling the number of Go routines on this watches. This was just like, you know, programming bug basically that was introduced, okay. you know. And uh, still, like, the SLO was fine, right? So we didn't see it at first, but using the perv dash where we can see, like, the changes over the time, we were able to spot that, you know, 99th percentile of pod startup latency increase from, like, three seconds to four seconds. And based on that, we were able to kind of, like, you know, see that, okay, it was within this time that the pod startup latency increased. Then we went through a few PRs and we picked this one that it's most likely this one. And um, then we work with uh, Wojtek to fix it. Yeah, so um, maybe to tweak the answer, I, I wouldn't, because I'm the one responsible for <laughs> that regression. So, um, um, I wouldn't say it was a bug. It was basically a, a, a thing, like how to, like when you are the, like implementing a feature or designing a feature, you want to get to like, to production as soon as possible. So. Um, there are like there are some shortcuts that you are sometimes like taking, and it it was like kind of like unaware shortcut that like we like the tests were passing, so we we didn't really pay that much attention. Um, but but yeah, it, like it it was basically um, don't over optimize if it's not really easy, or not not really needed. It appeared that it's actually needed, so so we like fixed that. But uh, but yeah. Okay, so yeah, you didn't you didn't have to ask somebody yourself in this case to uh, to remove a feature um, uh, or, or redesign something. Yeah, it, fortunately, it was relatively small change, so it, it's it, it wasn't like really like conceptually like we are paying like we are trying to pay as much attention as possible to the design itself, and once the design looks scalable. We should be pretty convinced that like the implementation is possible to do in a scalable way, and like even if the first attempt is not maybe scalable, then you you can re-implement it somehow or pieces of that um, and um, keep the same semantics, which is which is the core, right? Of, of, of it. Um, hey, so uh, you mentioned about the five K nodes number and. Basically, the edge scenarios are pushing that number quite to the edge, and I'm thinking about what what is your approach about how to tackling the the increment of eventually nodes that running in a higher uh, latency uh, environment. Um, I think we've never really focused on like the high latency environments, to be honest. Um, in terms of like increasing the number of nodes, like uh, GKE, which is like, is like Google managed uh, Kubernetes, we already support like 15,000 nodes. So it's, and it's built on top of Kubernetes. We need to do a bunch of like other things around to make, um, make that really work. And that was like a lot of work, but um, the building blocks from Kubernetes in, in open source Kubernetes are there. So um, it's not that it's impossible to get there. Um, if we didn't see enough use cases like, or people in, in open source community asking for more, um, so we didn't, uh, we didn't try to do that in open source because there's like a bunch of other things to do in open source to, to make that work, but, um, but it's, it's certainly possible if, if we will start hearing those requests. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, we, we've never really were looking into like um, edge cases or like the, the high latency or isolated things or things like that. So um, there is some work happening in that area, not in the context of, of scalability, but I'm not super familiar with that, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Okay, and the, and the last question. Oh, there is, you had. 
Yeah. Um, what do you think the biggest constraints on scalability are going forward with Kubernetes? Like, if you wanted to do 50,000 nodes, what are the biggest challenges you think you'd face? I think there are many different steps, many different things depending on like where exactly you would like to, to, to go. So I can imagine like going to 50,000 nodes with not much effort if you, for example, run just like simple batch pot per node workloads without using any sophisticated networking storage or anything like that. That, that shouldn't be that hard. Um, especially if like a, a low churn cluster and so on. So it really depends like um, what are the what are the dimensions that you would like to you would like to to stress more? Like usually networking stack um, is is something that is like most stressing the control plane because there are, um, most of other things are basically um, are basically. Okay, so maybe taking a step back. So uh, we should split the, the, the problems on like control plane components, which, which there are like very few of them. Or I mean, yeah, very few per cluster, not very few components, but very few per cluster, like very few instances of a single component per cluster. And those that are running on nodes. Um, and those that are running on nodes are usually like contributing like the, the highest number of like load on the control plane. Um, and from those, like the networking ones, are usually the, the most uh, um, the most stressing. So, so this is this is something that we definitely need to um, we need to come up with something if we really need to go go, go visibly higher than that. Um, in terms of individual components, it usually boils down to um, to throughput or things like that, like on, on the individual components, which um, which is kind of solvable at the per component level. So um, I would say being able to horizontally scale um, API server is something that is, that is fairly critical and that we may want to invest a little bit into that more. Um, the storage layer, so the etcd itself is, is potential bottlenecks. And then like um, the components themselves will, will or can drive like improvements if we really need to go higher, which is in dimension related to that component, which is usually will be throughput or the time to process all, all the objects uh, of a given type or something. Okay, thank you very thank much you. for coming.